Are you waiting for something? Why do you tap your feet? Are you running out of time? Someone told you that you're nothing. Is it true? Do you move? To keep up from your mind Or is that music you hear You say your joy in a box When there's trouble you You've got joy to spare You've saved it as a gift And when discord comes Your treasure's in a box You've got joy to spare You've saved it as a gift And when discord comes it treasures in a box. Da 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 You've got joy to spare Saved it as a gift And when discord comes Your, your treasure's in a box I said you've got joy to spare You've saved it as a gift And when discord comes your treasures in our box. Thank you so much for telling you all. Thank you. Would you all pray with me? <coughs> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable. Amen. So with that laugh and applause, I have a feeling that we're going to be okay. But due to recent disturbing developments in our political scene, I must start off today with a question. It appears to be completely possible to hijack several of the most powerful positions in our government's executive branch without knowing some very basic historical information. And we can't take anything for granted anymore. So here goes. Does everyone here know who Frederick Douglass was? 
Okay, okay. Does everyone here know that Frederick Douglass is no longer physically here on the earth? Okay. Any nays? Any abstentions? Okay, then I think we can continue. To recap, in a week when our country continued to entertain more potential death blows to our diminishing sense of democratic decency, an interesting resurrection took place. At the White House gathering to usher in Black History Month, a statement was made about the famous ex-slave abolitionist Jim Crow fighting Frederick Douglass. This statement seemed to suggest that Douglass might not only be little known, but that he also might still be alive. Here's the direct quotation. Frederick Douglass is an example of somebody who's done an amazing job and is getting recognized more and more, I noticed. Now note the present tense of this statement. It seems to suggest that Douglas is still kicking and might only recently be gaining traction as an organizer. More so, it seems to suggest that our White House has no idea who Frederick Douglass was. And the internet lost its mind. <laughs> Memes and tweets and jokes popped up like ghosts in a graveyard. You know, something's up when Frederick Douglass is trending on Twitter above Beyonce and Beyonce's pregnant! with twins! <laughs> but trend, he did. Everyone outside the White House was flabbergasted to once again be reminded that we are existing under the lily-white, ice-hearted thumbs of people who clumsy and ineffectually nod to Black History Month by simply revealing that they actually know nothing about Black history at all. It was as if somebody in the White House two minutes before the gathering had desperately Googled black people who are not MLK or Ben Carson, and then desperately scribbled down the first few names that popped up without any context. Now, perhaps we just have an administration that is easily confused by verb tenses. But we know better. The holes in this administration's grammar reveal the more insidious depths of the holes in everything else they do and say. Through the fumbling of this inane sentence, Frederick Douglass was in danger of being stripped of any specificity, honor, or core. He was in danger of literally becoming a faceless, contextless black name. So, past tense, we had reason to be outraged. Present tense, we continue to have reason to be outraged. For this, gaff seemed like just another lemon juice drop in the open wounds from the past 16 days, something for the butt of increasingly easy jokes. But for many, this ridiculousness added to a flood of fear, a growing list of reminders of how quickly negligence plus power snowballs and attempts to freeze this country deeper into a place of history forgotten, lives forgotten, and eventually history and lives lost. But those who might have had the most obvious reason to be outraged took that outrage and did something beyond fuming and joking. The family of Frederick Douglass, and officially the founders of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, released a statement on February 1st, flipping the entire script and reimagining how this moment could melt and reveal a deeper core that is far more than a punchline. They injected the specifics back into the conversation and demanded something different. Douglas's great-great-great-grandson said his first instinct upon viewing the White House footage was to go on the attack and rip a new one in this increasingly exhausting ignorance. And they did that. But that's not all they did. Instead, Frederick Douglass's descendants took the challenge. 
their only slightly sarcastic statement contained at its core this sentence. Like the president, we use the present tense when referencing Douglas's accomplishments because his spirit and legacy are still very much alive, not just during Black History Month, but every month. And on either side of that sentence, they did something amazing. Preceding it, they outlined 15 actual astonishing and historical things that Frederick Douglass has done an amazing job of and is getting more and more recognition for, including enduring the inhumanity of slavery, teaching himself to read and write, persuading the American public and Abraham Lincoln that we are all equal and deserving of the right to live free, arguing against unfair immigration restrictions, imagine that. And the list goes on. These 15 points were then followed by six points outlining the current present tense work of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. It suddenly became even clearer why our current administration would want to freeze themselves against learning any more than Douglass's name. The salty, bright details of who this man was and is at his core and the legacy he leaves behind for us to follow challenges everything this administration is doing. But thanks to the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, in this maddening moment, willfully ignored past history became reclaimed living present history. But it only happened because they demanded it. Now, you inquisitive, educated coastal elites might be able to name many ugly other Douglas advancements and achievements, but I encourage all of us to still look them up. And then I encourage us to internalize them again. And then I encourage us to accept the invitation from the Douglas family to speak of Douglas in the present tense, not the past tense. It's time to make the real lessons of our real past really present to all again. It's the only way to have a real future. But let's melt back even further in the past for a moment. Back past 1895, the year Frederick Douglass actually died, all the way back to the start of the Common Era, our ancient testimony that Johnny read is a gospel greatest hit. We're still at the top of the hill where Jesus has just delivered his brilliant beatitudes, and now he whips out these metaphors. You are the salt. You are the light. But you'll be worth nothing if you lose your flavor or hide your brightness. This is my second favorite passage in all of our scriptures. But this week, I found myself looking at it anew, both in the larger context of relentless spiritual exhaustion and in the more specific context of this week's Frederick Douglass verb tense flub. Because the White House's lazy Black History Month lecture was an attempt to strip away the salt and the light of black history. And it was therefore an attempt to strip away the salt and the light of all history. And we see the natural outcome of such stripping away here in Jesus' words. We'll be no good if we lose that flavor or hide that brightness. We'll be nothing. But there's hope here for those troubled folks who feel their salt spilling and their lights dimming. Maybe you feel that way. I certainly do. That hope lies in the verb tense that Jesus uses here. Notice the R's in both of these lines. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Not you were, or you will be, or you can be. You are in your core. No matter what anyone outside of you tries to freeze or hide around you, you already are deep 
inside you the two very things that can unfreeze and shed light in the present tense. No icy ignorance can last forever when there's salt and light coming from it from all sides. We're not waiting for some promised future that Christians are so famous for. We're not going to be salt and light in some far off time and place. We are salt and light right now if we allow ourselves to be. Now, bad news, the gaslighting, the willful dismissal of history is going to keep coming. That ice sheet is going to keep forming. It's going to keep making alternative icy roads. Don't take them. You are the antidote. You have the ingredients for endurance. For the Bible tells you so. In fact, if we stay true to this staggeringly simple thing Jesus said millennia ago, we don't even need the president's recent promise to demolish the Johnson Amendment's line between church and state. Christian freedom is not presently under threat. We are the salt and the light at our core beyond Christianity, beyond religion. I don't want to tell you from the pulpit who to vote for as if you would even listen to me. What we've got is just fine. A room and a community and tables where we come together to be reminded of who we are at our core, no matter what frozen hearts outside are trying to confuse us into something else. Now, there are many reasons to look toward the future, especially the possibilities available to us in two years. And I implore us to remember that organizing for the future is possible because we are salt and light now in the present tense. And we need to keep reminding one another of that fact because we're going to continue to have plenty of chances to forget it. So, I'm sometimes asked why I paint my nails. Confession. I paint my nails because I am in daily danger of losing my saltiness and my lightness. I am in daily danger of forgetting who I really am. This world makes it too easy to forget. There are too many gaslighting confusions and too many invitations to freeze myself into an easier, ignorant, lazy life. So I paint my fingernails to remember who I am. And some of you might know this story, but the day that I decided to do this, was back in 2013. And I was sitting on a Q train going over the Manhattan Bridge. And I sat across from the most glorious, budding peacock of a college student, decked out in genderqueer couture, earrings, mascara, tight jeans, tight t-shirt, and painted glittery nails. Reading Audre Lorde. A few seats away, two boys around this person's age snickered and whispered about him in the entire seven-minute ride over the bridge. I know the peacock knew the boys were jeering, but I never looked up to them, and I noticed that the peacock never looked up at them either. And I, nondescript gay man in my nondescript plaid shirt and jeans, caught myself thinking, oh, sweetie, if you would just not be so outlandish, if you would just not be so made up, if you would just not be so that, you'd be so much better off. But I stayed quiet and cringing until I reached my stop and I got off. And as I walked home, my macho myopia became exceedingly clear. And this is someone who didn't even realize today was Super Bowl Sunday until last night. <laughs> even I, out gay man that I was and am, had thought to tell someone to tamp down their saltiness 
to tamp down their brightness, their lightness, tamp down their core emanating from within. And I melted and decided that from then on, I would have a painted, glittered hand to remind me who I am deep down inside at my core, a salty, bright light. And whenever I might want to tamp down my own saltiness or brightness, whenever I might want someone else to tamp down their own, my hand reminds me. It reminds me to unfreeze myself, to look deeper, to remember these images of resistance from Jesus so long ago and make them present tense again. The powers that be keep telling us to hush, to forget who we are, to go with the ice flow, to see what happens. But our salty, bright cores compel us otherwise. And maybe you have tricks. Maybe it's not nail polish, maybe it is. Maybe you have tricks to remind you of who you actually are beneath all the fear. I hope you do, because you are so glorious right now. Jesus said so. But just in case you could use a trick, here's my very, very simple takeaway for today. I rarely tell people that scripture is definitively the answer, but today I actually encourage you to take the ancient and modern testimonies, cut them out, paste them, tape them, do whatever you want with them and put them on your mirror or use them as bookmarks, at least for the next four years. Both Jesus' words and Douglas's words are reminders that endurance defines the strength of our core, and endurance defines the limits of who, those who seek to distract us from our cores. Don't let them feed you alternative facts or false history. Our combined salt and light can melt this winter of our discontent. So, as we do at all of our agape meals, we have a chance now to melt in front of each other, to share our salt, share our light as we gather elements for our communion moment. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes to chat. You don't know somebody sitting across from you. Share with them some of your salt, some of your light. Get some back at you. And we'll come back together and have communion in just a moment. Go for it. Yeah.